I still remember vividly my very first speeding ticket. How many of you do? You think back to, yeah, there's quite a few hands there. Now, I've, I've had speeding tickets since that time. You don't need to know how many. Just we'll use the, the plural form of the word. Um, but uh, I don't remember all of them very well. But that very first one, there's just something about sometimes when you experience something for the first time in life, especially when uh, it really stirred up some emotion and all at the time that uh, uh, that really imprints in your memory. So that very first time, I was given a ticket for going 32 miles an hour in a 20 zone. And this was in Silver Lake. I was 16 years old, and I think I was targeted, but... Uh, you know, um, no, actually, actually, it was, you know, and, and I Googled this to see if the old police station, which was City Hall as well back in the 70s, little dinky building underneath the old water tower, um, and it's still there. But uh, um, I, I, so I Googled Silver Lake and police station, and I immediately, the first two, two hits, of, of websites that, that I could go to had to do with, with uh, speed traps in the USA, and Silver Lake was listed as one of them. <laughs> and I really fought the temptation. I wanted to go in there and put a comment on there that's, you know, like 40 years ago, you know, such and such happened, but, but I didn't do it. So, uh, so I had this ticket, 32 miles an hour in 20. And, uh, you know, it, it was, the speed limit was going slower. It was, every speed limit sign was reducing from 40 to 30. I had just passed the 31. I was approaching um, the 21, but I still had another 30, 35 feet or so before I was going to hit that. And, uh, um, and sure enough, that's when it happened. The policeman, he pulled out and gave me this ticket and, and set a date where I was supposed to show up at the police station and pay the fine. And, and uh, of course, you know, I confided in all of these knowledgeable people. I gathered together all the most bright, brilliant minds I could think of. I'm talking about my classmates in high school <laughs> and uh, my older brother who's two years older than me. And I was trying to explain, this was my situation. This is where I was, the intersection that he says he got me at. And... Uh, um, so what's what's the scoop there? And they all said, "You got to fight this. You got to fight it because he's got not a leg to stand on, and because you weren't at the twenty yet, you had just passed the thirty, and and uh, so man, I was getting all charged up. Like I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say I'm not paying this, and I was going to explain the reasons why. So anyway, the day came where uh, I showed up, and of course, n none of my counselors were with me, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, I pulled up there, and, and the, the police car was there, and some other car was there. So there, there was only two guys. You couldn't fit many more inside that building. But there was just two guys that, that were in there. And uh, um, as soon as I turned the key off, turned my car off, all of a sudden, the wave of emotion shifted. And all of a sudden, I was overcome with fear. You know, it was just like, I'm 16 years old. And I'm going in there face to face, you know, with the policeman and who knows what else is in there. And, and the uncertainty was unnerving. And as I opened the door, I was even more scared. As I started stepping out, I was even more scared. And, uh, you know, the short of the story is um, I, uh, I did pay the fine, <laughs> but I did not admit that I was speeding. <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I didn't. I, I, uh, and I did ask a policeman right before this service started how that works. And he said, you shouldn't have gotten a ticket if you hadn't hit the 20 mile an hour speed limit yet. So I'm going to go see if I can get my money back <laughs> later. <laughs> All right. You know, if you stop and think about it, you could probably come up with any number of uh, um, events and times in your life where you experience some really strong fear. 
right? I mean, that, that was one for me, and it really left an imprint in my mind, because I really was scared as I was walking in that building, not knowing um, what to, to I was going to experience. And, but, you know, if you think about it, you could probably think about uh, <clears throat> times like uh, uh, way back when you were in school, you know, final exams. You know, maybe, maybe that was the night before as you would go to sleep, you just had a hard time sleeping, uh, or you woke up early and just were dreading what was going to happen and fearful you were going to fail the, the, the final exam, and that was going to be like third of your grade and all of this. And so, you know, you know, you've got certain times in your life. Or like when you were in that, it's not a waiting room, right? It's, it's like the room right before you go into surgery. I, I can't remember what that room's called, but, but uh, you're laying in there, you know, and, and there's a whole bunch of other people and they're all just waiting to be wheeled in and then it was going to happen, you know, whatever the surgery is. And, and that's kind of an unnerving moment, right? A lot of you have been there before. And you know how scary that moment can be, especially if it's a major surgery. And you know the difference between a major and a minor surgery, right? A minor surgery is when you're having a surgery. A major surgery is when I'm having the surgery, okay? <laughs> but, you know, at, the, at that moment in time, you know, that, that's really scary. And, of course, they, they'll give you a shot or something or other to take the edge off and, because they know people really get scared at times like that. Or when a doctor uses the C word and says... The test results come back and you have cancer. You know, all of a sudden, your mind just, you got stuff flying through your mind of all the different people you've known, family members, close friends, stuff, that in the battles people have had with cancer. And, and boy, the fear level just starts building at that moment. We all have things in life that have stirred up fear. Well, what we've been talking about for the last three Sundays, it's, it's on the slide, it's on the screen, it's on your bulletin cover. I mean, this certainly represents, it qualifies for being something that stirs up fear in people's lives. You know, and understandably so. I mean, there is a scary element. The realization that there is going to be a day called Judgment Day is really intimidating. When you think about it, especially then when you consider certain verses in the Bible that reference it. For example, this one, and I almost chose this one uh, to be our memory verse this week. And, uh, but then, you know, it just, you know, I thought I don't want to cause Ron, you know, nightmares this week, you know, with this memory verse. But, I mean, look at this and, and read it for what it's worth. It says in Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, you know, that may not be as intimidating right now because we got all the lights on and there's like 300 and some of us that are in this room. And, you know, it's, it, but when you're all by yourself, you know, you're all by yourself and it's dark and you're in the house alone or something and, no TV, no radio on, and you reflect on something like that, that's a little unnerving, right? That's a little fearful. And you can't even start thinking that, well, you know, I really hope that that one particular phase of my life, it escaped his notice that God was preoccupied with something else and he didn't know. Uh, uh, that, that's not even a line of thought that you or I can entertain because, again, it says nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Nothing. Nothing has escaped his notice. And that's basically what's being said there. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Or this verse, and we looked at this a couple of times in the series already. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, where it says, Then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. The word fled, literally, and I don't know what word you might have in your translation there, but the word literally means run away. Literally means run away. So you get this idea that, that the great white throne, it's occupied, the judge is sitting there, the creator of the heavens and the earth, all mankind. And then it says, earth and heaven wanted to run away but no place was found for them. That meant there was no place to hide. 
there was no place for them to go. Yeah, I mean, you see stuff like this in some of these passages, and you totally understand why this is kind of a scary topic. But over the last couple of Sundays, we've had some good news, right? If you've been with us the last two Sundays, one of those Sundays, our memory verse was 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, that says, Now little children, abide in him. And we emphasized how important that phrase, abide in him, and what that means. And it says, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Well, wow, that's really good news, that we can actually have confidence in regards to the great day when our Lord comes, which is when Judgment Day and all of that stuff's going to be playing out. We can have confidence and not even have to contend with an urge to run away, to shrink away. There, there will be, there's no need for even that urge to be within us. That's the good news of this passage of Scripture. It's music to our ears. And last Sunday, we looked at the reason, what the reason was or is behind that confidence. And the thing that I really tried to be emphatic with, and so I'll repeat it now since we're kind of summarizing the series, but also so that you don't forget, the reason that we can have that confidence has nothing to do with your performance. It's not because you've towed the line well enough that God's given you a thumbs up and so you have nothing to fear on Judgment Day. Uh uh. Your performance is what got you into trouble to begin with. And it's what got me into trouble to begin with. Yeah, our, our performance, that, that's not something that works in our favor. Uh uh-uh, uh. That's not it at all. But what does make the difference, and this was our verse last Sunday. 1 John 4, 10, love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, I told you that word appears a handful of times in the New Testament. And a lot of times I try to, you know, use other translations that use simpler words. But you know what? This is one of those those verses that I don't want to use simpler words because it'll cheapen what is contained there. We'll read the the simplified words, and we won't dig deeper to try to understand what exactly does this concept mean. And this is one of those concepts you need to dig deeper, because, wow, it's rich in meaning. Propitiation. Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. The word literally means to... to, um, redirect the wrath of God, to turn aside the wrath of God. And where did he turn it to, which we talked about last week? He turned it on to himself when he was on the cross. That's why Jesus' death on the cross, it it was a, um, a sacrifice of propitiation where God's judgment and wrath against our sin since Jesus took our sin upon himself he redirected God's wrath off of us and onto himself on the cross that's what happened on the cross and that's why I said it wasn't his cross that was your cross and in exchange what did he do there's other verses that give us more insight they're not using that same word propitiation but yet, like 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. What an incredible thought. That, that all the, the sin and, and the guilt and all of that, Jesus took upon himself. And in its place, we received Jesus' righteousness. And that's why we can have confidence in regards to how the end times are going to play out. All right, so that kind of summarizes where we're at in this series. But it also kind of raises a question. Does does standing before the Lord on Judgment Day need to be a part of the equation for Christians? I mean, if all of that is true, 
that Jesus took our punishment upon himself so that we could be released from that, we could be free from our sin. If all of that is true, then is Judgment Day even necessary for believers? It's a good question, but there's a very clear answer. And so let's just put it on the table and make it clear right now. Christians will stand before Christ's judgment seat. This is something that is clearly taught in Scripture. And, you know, based on the question that I had on the connection card, you know, last Sunday, I mean, the answers were kind of all over the place, you know, and, and so it does show me that, that we're not all on the same page in understanding this concept. And so let's, let's talk about this today. But this is where we really need to begin is just by affirming the fact that uh, Christians, uh, believers in Christ, will stand before him as he's seated on the judgment seat. The Bible is pretty clear about that. However, I will, I will throw in that a good case can be made that that Revelation 20 passage uh, may not be referencing Christians at all. The passage where it says that people were trying to, to, to flee you know, from heaven and earth trying to flee, but there was no place for them. And that passage goes on and explains how they were being judged by the books and all the contents in the books. And, and it talks about the lake of fire, you know, verse, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. But there's no direct reference made to Christians standing there. And a pretty good case can be made that that passage perhaps is just only talking about unbelievers. And what they're going to experience on the day. But before we, you know, make some kind of a sweeping conclusion saying, well, see, maybe we don't have to. There are some passages that are clear. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for example, says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Okay, so that verse is really clear, and it is written to Christians. Paul was writing this to the Christians in the church in Corinth, and notice he uses the word we. He's including himself. He's saying, I'm going to be standing there too, folks. This is Paul, the apostle. He's saying, I'm going to be there too. But every one of us as believers, we will find ourselves at that time standing before the judgment seat of Christ. And then there's another one, this Romans chapter 14 passage verses 10 to 12 this is paul writing a letter to the church in rome again he's talking to christians in the church and the capital letters here that's basically a quote from the old testament but here's what he says for we will all stand before the judgment seat of god for it is written as i live says the lord every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to god so then each one of us will give an account of himself to god the, word, the, the words judgment day, identical terminology used in both of those passages, 2 Corinthians 5 and the one that's on the screen. So it's going to happen, but there's a difference. There is a difference between what an unbeliever is going to experience at that time because they are going to be judged on the basis of their performance because they don't have the blood of Christ covering their sin. There's a difference between the way an unbeliever and the way a believer uh, is going to go through this process. You see, this, what's being spoken of in passages like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is not a judgment that determines eternal de um, destina your eternal destination. This is not a judgment that determines that. That's already been covered by the blood of Jesus, and that's why Paul had earlier said in passages like Romans chapter 8, verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. There's, there's no condemnation. So when you're standing before him, there, there's not a, a, a condemnation as far as the gavel coming down and a judgment that you have sinned, you are guilty, and you know, that's not going to happen because there's no condemnation. For a believer, this isn't God judging our sin. 
That happened when Jesus died on the cross. That's when God judged our sins. Jesus took them upon himself, and God judged him, and that's the, the death, the sacrifice that Jesus made at that time. That was the judgment that actually took care of our sin. What God has done for us is taken care of our sin now through Jesus. But what we do for God, that still requires his evaluation. And that's what these passages are talking about. You see, what the scripture is teaching is that he is going to examine what you have done in your life. He is going to examine your life. The way that you've lived your life. One of the most insightful passages of Scripture that breaks this down further for us is this one found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 11. I invite you to turn there. I'm not going to be able to show all that on the screen because there's too many verses. I will show one verse here in a moment. But uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, especially starting in verse 11, and, and, you know, just to show you, he's, he's using an analogy here. In verse 11, he says, For no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, he's, he's going to be talking about building terminology here. But he's not talking about building a house. It's an analogy. Now, this isn't something that Paul just came up on his own. As a matter of fact, Jesus is the one who started all of this. You remember in the Sermon on the Mount, after Jesus got done talking about the Beatitudes and all of that, you know, he, he ended that whole sermon with the final verses in Matthew chapter 7 by saying that anyone who hears my words and acts on them is like what? Is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the storm came, the wind blew, the waves, the water rose and beat against that house. But the house stood firm because it was on a rock. But anyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus went on to say, and they go in one ear and out the other, he doesn't act upon them. He's like a man who built his, his house on sand. And the storm came and the rain fell and the winds blew and and eventually that house fell with a great collapse because it was built on sand. You see, Jesus was the one who used this whole terminology of how your life can be likened to the building of a house. Well, Paul basically is picking up on that analogy thinking, and he's using that here in this passage. And so that's why he says at the tail end of verse 10, he says, each one must be careful how he builds on it, talking about this foundation. Uh, and then in verse 11, so let's just kind of break it down and look through it a little bit. Verse 11, he says, for no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, remember, Remember, this is being written to Christians. This isn't a letter to, to anybody and everybody. It's written to people who have made a profession of faith, people who are followers of Jesus. And he's, he, he makes it clear in verse 11 that uh, um, no one can lay any other foundation than the one that has been laid for us. And what is that foundation? It's Jesus Christ. We all are building or have the opportunity to build our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ because of our faith. All right, so that's the foundation. And we, sh we all share that in common. That is the foundation that is available to us as we build our life, as we live our life, as we make our decisions as to how we're going to do this, how we're going to spend time, what we're going to invest ourselves in, all of that kind of stuff. This represents the foundation. The foundation is Jesus. Now look at verse 12. If anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, let's pause right there. So he starts, he starts listing out some, some building materials and he uses gold and silver and precious stones. Um, the, these aren't necessarily building materials that you would build, use if you were building a house. But again, remember, this is an analogy. Gold and silver and precious stones, wood, straw, or hay. He's just saying now there's, there's, there's multiple different choices here as to what we're going to build our life with. 
how we're going to go about building our life. That's the point that verse 12 is making. Now we're ready for verse 13, and this is the key verse, so I'm going to show you this on the screen. He says, each, right after talking about all the different building materials, he says, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. All right, so he's saying the day will disclose it. What did I tell you in the very first message? Anytime you're seeing in the New Testament that kind of terminology where it's not just referring to a day, it uses the definite article, the day or that day. What is that a reference to? Okay, he didn't have to spell it all out, judgment day, but everybody knows this is what he's talking about. For the day, judgment day, is going to disclose. Everyone's work is going to become obvious. Some translations use the terminology evident. Um, uh, how you've built your life, the quality of your life, it's going to become very clear on that day because the quality of your life is going to be tested. Do you see what's happening? Let's just pause for a moment in that passage. But do you see what's, what's being developed here, what Paul is saying? On the day of judgment, the Lord is going to determine just how productive your life really was. That's the bottom line. He, he's going to determine just how productive your life really was, whether or not you did anything of lasting value. In regards to how you used your time, for example, all of us have the same amount of time available to us. We have 168 hours in any given week. But we all, can, I mean, we, we all share the same foundation, which are, if you're a follower of Christ, but how are you going to use that 168 hours this week, next week, the week following? How are you going to do that? Well, you may make totally different choices and decisions than I do. See, we're all building differently, perhaps. And that, the point here is that that matters. How you choose to spend your time. The abilities or the gifts that you have received. Whatever the talents are that you have. How do you utilize them? Do you just sit on your hands and do nothing with it? Or do you actually use the abilities and the gifts that you have? And then the question is, if you do use them, okay, are you using them in a self-serving way? Or are you using them to advance the kingdom of God. See, that, that all of this is going to become evident. How generous you are, not just with time, but with your resources, money, and all of that. How that was used during your life. Your sphere of influence on people. How did you use that? Did you use that with, with big picture thinking in mind? Influencing people in regards to the big picture of life? Or did you do it in a short-sighted sort of a way? All of that's going to become clear on that day. The quality of your life and the quality of my life will be tested. That's what it says there in the scripture. It says it will be tested by fire. And the question is, what will it show? You see, there's going to be fire. The scripture says, and remember it's an analogy, so I don't know as it's literal fire like this. If I held my finger there long enough, it burned me. I, I, I don't know, you know, you can take that literal. But, but what the scripture is saying is that my life and your life, the quality of our lives, how we spent our life, how we invested, it, it's all going to be tested by fire. And so let's just say that this represents your life. Okay, I mean, as I was thinking about this passage, this was one of the first thoughts that came to my mind. Let's just say this represents um, the last 20 years of your life. It was 20 years ago, let's say, that you made a decision for Christ and you became a follower of his. And your sins and all that, Jesus took care of that. But for the last 20 years, you have been living with the foundation of Jesus as your life. And, and now, based on the choices and the decisions and the things you've done and the ways that you've invested your life, um, this now represents your life on that day 
as you find yourself standing before the Lord. And so what this passage of Scripture is saying is that Jesus is going to test the quality of your life, whether it was straw or hay or, or just what it was. And it's very possible it's all going to burn up. It's, yeah, yeah, you like that? Yeah. Now, now watch this. I'm going to pull a rabbit out of your neighbor's ear. Okay. <laughs> but you see, as you look in this passage, this is what you see developing. Now, again, it doesn't have to be that way where it all burns up because the whole point of the matter of what this day represents for believers is that it is his plan to reward each according to their works. He wants to reward you. And he wants to reward me. The word judgment seat that is found there in the text it does, is the same terminology that is used in regards to where Pilate sat. You know, it's the same terminology. But it's also the same terminology that was commonly used back in that time in regards to the judges at, at the athletic competition as they would make decisions as to who won the events and they would dish out the different, the different rewards or medals or wreaths or whatever it was that they were given to people. And see, this, this is what Jesus is wanting to do, is he's wanting to reward each of us according to our works. Look at verses 14 and 15 in our text before we get away from 1 Corinthians 3. It says, If anyone's work that he has built survives... He will receive a reward. Anyone's work, the way you spent your life, and in God's value system, as he looks at your life and he sees value in some of the things that you did in your life, it will survive. And you will be rewarded for that. That's what verse 14 is saying. But verse 15 is talking about what you saw just happen up here. Verse 15 says, if anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, but he will be saved, yet it will be like an escape through fire. You see, the picture there is like a person that was in a building, a burning building, and as the whole house was in flames and starting to collapse, this person ran out of the house, and right then it all collapsed and it all just burnt to cinders. And this guy got out, but he has nothing. He has nothing in his hands to show for his life and how he spent his time and what he invested in and collected and all of this kind of stuff. It's all now been destroyed. He, though, survives. But, you know, it's kind of like, wow, he, he made it just by the skin of his teeth. And that's kind of what verse 15 is saying. It's saying because your foundation is Jesus Christ as a follower of his, even if in the last 20 years since the time that you had made that decision, you have not been doing things of value in God's economy, in God's perspective, but because of your faith in Christ, you're going to be saved. But as far as any kinds of additional rewards or any of that, there's not going to be any. I mean, that's basically what, what is being brought out here. In this passage, the Bible is very specific that any work that we do, which God sees as having value, will be rewarded. Look at the very last chapter in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 22, um, and this too is written to Christians, and these are some of the closing words, the final words of Jesus that are recorded in the Bible. And he says this, look, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to repay each person according to what he has done. You see, it's talking about the same concept there. The very thing that we're talking about here. Now, what these rewards are going to consist of, I really don't know. <laughs> if you've been saving space on your outline for writing down all the different rewards, then I'm sorry. I don't have anything to give you. Because I, I really don't know what these rewards are, are going. Does it mean that we're going we're gonna to have a room in God's house that's a little closer to his room? Or does it mean we have a larger room? Or does it mean we won't have to have silver? We have gold in everything? I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've read some books on this topic and, and parts of books about this. I've heard several sermons where people talk about this concept of these additional rewards. 
Um, and, you know, and like the most recent one that I've got in my library, you know, it talks, it talks about the different crowns that are referenced in the New Testament and saying that these represent uh, the different rewards that Christians can receive. You know, an incorruptible crown, a crown of life, a crown of rejoicing, a crown of glory, a crown of righteousness. There's the outline of that book. Five different rewards. And the, the entire chapters are devoted to breaking it down. And I look all that over and everything, and I say, well, this is a nice thought, but I can't really see that this is anchored in Scripture. I don't really see that this is clearly being taught in Scripture. And so I have a hard time building theology based on something that, that I don't see being clearly represented in the Bible. So I don't know. I don't know what our rewards are, but I do, I do know this. This is just one more way that Christianity is different from other religions. Every other religion in the world teaches that good deeds, that good deeds are what take you to heaven. Every other religion teaches that. I mean, even if you're talking about heaven in regards to nirvana or something like that, I mean, that, that statement is true. All other religions in the world teach that good deeds take you to heaven. But that is clearly not what the Bible teaches. The Bible is very clear about that. The Bible does not teach that good deeds take you to heaven. Rather, instead, the Bible teaches that good deeds follow you to heaven. And there is a difference there. And this is your memory verse this week. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, where it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds will follow them. Isn't that an interesting concept? Their good deeds will follow them. See, we're not saved by our good deeds, but we are saved for good deeds. And, and our Lord plans to reward us with those good deeds that have value in his eyes. The ways that we've invested our life in ways that meet with his approval. Why do Christians stand before the judgment seat? The reason is so that God can reward us for what we've done for him. The Bible really doesn't explain, like I said, any detail in regards to what those rewards look like, but the point is we are accountable for how we spend our lives. And that is kind of the bottom line in all of this. We can't just, we can't just go about living our life and living any which way we want, just doing our own thing and whatever, whatever the urge is at the moment, this is what we're going to do or this is what our feelings are leading us into doing and making these decisions. That's not the way to approach life. We will answer for the way that we've lived our lives as believers. There will come a day where, where, where God's going to look it over. He's going to review and nothing escapes his notice. Now, sin's not going to be part of the factor or the equation in all of that because Jesus, our Lord, took care of that. But in regards to how we invest our life, how we spend our time and all of this kind of stuff, that is what God's going to be looking at. And that should motivate us in the way we go about living our life. You can't, just, you can't do anything about lost opportunities of the past. In the example I was given earlier, if you made a decision for Christ and became a follower of his 20 years ago, but you just kind of been sitting on your hands since then, doing your own thing, kind of everything was self-serving and just involving you and yourself, and that's it. Well, you can't go back and relive the last 20 years. You can't ca recapture the opportunities that you missed in the past. There's nothing you can do about that. There's nothing I can do about that. But the opportunities that are ahead of you, that is something you can do, something about. You can make your life count by seizing those opportunities, whether, whether you're here today and you've only got two years left or whether you've got 20 more years. You do have the wherewithal to make those years count by the decisions that you make. Now, this isn't a verse. Uh, this isn't a verse uh, that is specifically talking about Judgment Day, but yet, in a very real sense, it does, it, it, it does apply to what it is that we're talking about here today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, it says, Therefore, my 
Dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, like I said, that's not talking about Judgment Day per se, but yet it, it applies to, to what it is we're looking at here. It says, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that all of this, all of this effort, all of the, the labor, all of the work that you put into as far as serving the Lord is concerned, it is not in vain. So here's my opinion on it, and I feel pretty strongly about this, and so I'll state, I'll state it that way. It is my belief that when, when you or I find ourselves standing before the Lord, because as believers, we're all going to be there. Paul's going to be there too, as he said in that scripture we looked at earlier. When we find ourselves standing before him, giving an account of our lives, let me tell you something you're not going to regret. I do not believe it will enter your mind. I do not think this is something you're going to be there and you're going to be thinking, oh, why did I do that? What am I talking about? I'm talking about spending time in the nursery down the hallway, watching other people's babies and changing their diapers. I don't think there is a single person, and a number of you in here have, have done that or are getting ready to do that the next service, I don't think there is a single person that will stand before the Lord on that day and they're going to be like, oh, why did I waste all those hours in that church nursery? I, that's just not going to enter your mind as something you regret because there will be no reason to regret that, that kind of service. Or I don't think that there's going to be anybody that's going to be standing there before the Lord and they're going to be kicking themselves. Ugh. Why did I try to witness to my coworker? <laughs> Man, what was I thinking? <clears throat> Man, what did I, why did I do that? I should have just kept my mouth shut and not tried to, to influence them as far as Jesus is concerned. I don't think there's a single person that's going to kick themselves or hit their head in regards to that. You will not regret that. I don't think there's anyone that's going to regret taking some of their hard-earned money that they worked for, they sweated for, and they took out of their, their paycheck and they gave it for the purpose of furthering God's kingdom. I don't think on that day, as you're standing before the Lord, you're going to look back and you're going to regret a single dollar that you gave to further the gospel. That's not something you're going to regret. I don't think anyone is going to regret on that day having led a small group, a Bible study group. I mean, even though you knew when you signed up and volunteered to lead that group, you were taking a risk that certain people were going to sign up and be a part of that group, and you all know who I'm talking about. You know, when I say certain people, you were afraid that that certain person or two was going to be in your group, and you took that. I don't think you're going to regret that even if they did sign up and they were in your group. <laughs> You're not going to regret that because you were doing that in the service of the Lord. You're not going to regret visiting the sick. You're not going to regret helping out that needy neighbor. You're not going to regret volunteering of your time to do something that doesn't further your cause. It's a pure, selfless act of helping someone else. You're not going to regret stuff like that. But I will tell you what I believe you will regret. I believe at that time you're standing before the Lord if you have been a person that chose to just kind of do your own thing and uh, not give of your time and give of yourself for the benefit of others. And you just kind of did your own thing and served your own cause. I think you're going to regret that. I do. I think you'll stand there and you'll be like, why was I so wrapped up in myself? I think it's something you'll regret. If you're a person that has invested yourself in stuff of this world that you're going to leave behind, and that took a big chunk of who you were during your years of being a Christian here on earth, 
I think when you stand before the Lord at that time, that's something you very well may regret, having done that. Stuff that doesn't have significance beyond tomorrow, the investment you made. Short-sighted living, that's what that's called. And I think you'll regret the short-sighted living, the time that you spent in that mode of thinking here on earth. You see, this is the reason why the Scripture gives this kind of counsel, like what we find in Ephesians 5, where it says, Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. You don't know for sure how many more opportunities you've got. I don't know how many more opportunities I've got. It might be measured by days or weeks. It might be measured by years or decades. The fact is, we don't know. We don't know how many opportunities. But that's all the more reason why we need to be careful how we live. And we need to seize the opportunities that we have. So we build, in a way, on the foundation of Christ, that we build on a way that meets God's approval. Because in the end, that's all that matters. We're going to be singing a song that will lead into our time of communion, but uh, I want us to prepare our hearts for that. Would you pray with me at this time? Father, I'm thankful for how your word talks about a topic that can be kind of intimidating and we sometimes want to steer away from because it makes us nervous. But yet, at the same time, Lord, when we look at it, as we've done here this morning, it is something that actually is convicting and inspiring at the same time helping to, to point us in a direction of our life and how we go about living our life and spending our time and making investments and, and all. It gives us more clarity of thought. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit will indeed continue to convict and to guide us in the days ahead so that we will utilize the opportunities that we have to build our lives in a way that meets your approval. I'm thankful, Lord, that we don't need to fret and worry about sin in regards to judgment, knowing that as Christians that Jesus has taken care of that. His death, burial, and resurrection all represents the price that he paid when he redirected the judgment and wrath against sin onto himself so we could be freed from that. Father, in a few moments as we take the bread and we eat it in the cup and we drink it, we reflect on that incredible sacrifice of propitiation where he did for us what we just couldn't do for ourselves. Father, we celebrate the life we have in Christ and we celebrate the confidence that we can have as we look forward to the day of your return. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.